Welcome to the Triangle Microworks IEC 60870-5 Communication Protocol Training Videos. This is the third video in the series. In the first video, we gave an overview of IEC 60870-5 and talked about stack layers and a little bit about the application layer. In the second video, we dug into details about the ASDUs. And in this third video, we're going to talk more about the application layer, including polling and controls. Okay, so let's dig in and look in a little more detail at the application layer. Within the application layer, the standard identifies something known as application functions. These are basically the requests which can be sent either from the master or the outstation. We'll quickly go through some of these. We're not gonna cover all of these in detail, but there's an initialization sequence which the master controls. Uh, there's a data acquisition by polling, which is a little misleading because this is just for 101 unbalanced mode. Uh, the other common ways for the outstation to send data are through cyclic data transmission, uh, which is for static data. And then there's acquisition of events, which would be for sending event data or data changes. And then of course, there's the general interrogation that we briefly talked about before. That's the equivalent of the class zero poll in DNP3. The master can request a clock synchronization. It can send commands to the outstation. There's a way for sending integrated totals or basically counter measurements. Um, there's a parameter loading, uh, which is a way for the master to send certain parameters to the outstation. There are testing requests, file transfer requests, and a request to acquire the transmission delay. Some of these are control requests from the master, some are from the outstation, and I'm just gonna go over a few of these that are some of the more important ones to know. So the first one is an interrogation. This is basically how the outstation can send current values to the master. The master can request a general interrogation, which sends back all of the points, or you can define subsets of groups of points, which are set up on the outstation, and the master just requests that particular group of points. Those groups of points can be totally customized, and when the master sends an interrogation, it can include the QOI, or the qualifier of interrogation, uh, and the QOI determines whether this is a general interrogation or an interrogation for a defined group of points. A GI is performed after the initialization sequence so that the master can synchronize its database with the data in the outstation. So this is basically like a class zero poll in DNP3. The standard also specifies what will be included in this interrogation. And basically it includes all of the relevant cause of transmission. So it includes periodic, cyclic, background scan, and spontaneous. Uh, so pretty much all of the data. So let's take a look at a typical interrogation sequence. Here we can see the controlling station sending a GI or ASDU 100 with an act or a cot or cause of transmission of six. The control station responds with an act con, which is a cause of transmission of seven. It then sends the monitored data. As you can see, it will send multiple monitored ASDUs in response to the GI, each of which has a cot or cause of transmission of 20. And then it wraps up the general interrogation sequence by sending an act term or a cot of 10. There's also the capability to request a read of a particular point or a particular ASDU. This is supported through the read command. This ASDU type is type 102. It's important to point out that this is not one of the application functions per se. It's one of the commands which is supported. So only a single object can be read with each read request. So really, in order to read a lot of different objects, it's better to do an interrogation, either as a subset or as a complete general interrogation. One other basic function is the ability for the outstation to have either cyclic or periodic or background scan. This is a way for the outstation to send sample data to the master on a periodic basis. This is really for static data, which needs to be sent over. Um, so even if the data has not changed, it's still sent with a new sample and could include a time tag with that. So the outstation tells the master the cause of transmission. So it was a one or a two, one is for cyclic, two is for background. They are very similar, but cyclic is typically used with a faster sampling time. The specification doesn't really say why you would do a cyclic versus a background scan, but generally the background scan is just a slower period than the cyclic. The important thing here is that the master is not sending a pull request at the application layer. The outstation is directly sending this data to the master on a periodic basis. So in some ways, this is kind of equivalent to an unsolicited response in DNP3. However, it's done on a periodic basis. In DNP3, 
the unsolicited response always contains event data or data changes. Whereas this cyclic and background scan is still static data, it's just being sent on a regular basis without the need for a pull from the master. Another function is called the acquisition of events. This is where the outstation can identify events or data changes and sends them to the master with the cause of transmission of spontaneous. So the specification defines which ASDUs can be spontaneous and in a similar way, it defines which ASDUs can be cyclic. Once again, the master does not send a request for this at the application layer. The outstation just sends it as the event occurs. This would be very equivalent to unsolicited messages in DNP3, which also contain event data. Note that although spontaneous transmissions and DNP3 unsolicited responses are similar, there are a few differences. In particular, with DNP3, the master can suppress unsolicited responses, so it can send a command telling the outstation to stop sending unsolicited responses. You cannot do that in 608.70-5. There is no disable for a spontaneous message. The outstation can choose to send them or not, but the master cannot tell the outstation to stop sending them. Another function talked about in the specification is polling. Polling is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, this is what we talked about before. There's no real application layer polling like there is in DNP3. The polling they're referring to here is to support multi-drop links for IEC 608.70-101. It is the link layer which is doing this polling. It's only for the unbalanced mode where the master is requesting user data at the link layer and basically telling the outstation to go ahead and send me anything you have. So this allows the 101 unbalanced mode outstation to send things as it has them. It defines this as class one and class two data. Basically the spontaneous or event data is class one and class two data is the cyclic or background data, which is static. After any requests on the link layer, the outstation can say that it has class one data and then the master can give it permission to send that. Note that the class one and class two data at the link layer in IEC 608.70-5 is not at all related to the class one and class two data referred to in the DNP3 specification. In the 608.70-5, if you have an unbalanced link later, there's two classes of responses or their priorities of responses. There's the high priority and a lower priority. And the responses are assigned to those two different classes. In the Triangle Microworks library, we don't even let you choose what class they're assigned to. Theoretically, you can choose what class they're assigned to, but it has a little real value because no matter what the master asks for, you can always send the high priority response. You really don't need to think too much about this. It's implemented in the library. We do it according to the specification and things are assigned to one of the two classes. But it's important to know because somebody's gonna start talking about class one and class two and confusing it with the NP3 classes, which is completely unrelated and you're gonna to wanna to know the difference. The specification also describes controls. This is basically where the master is making a request for one of these application functions. So if it's doing interrogation or a read or sending a command, then it uses the ASDU type to identify what type of control it is. It also uses a few of the cause of transmissions. For example, when the master sends a request, it sends an activation, COT6. When the outstation sends back the confirm, it's the at con, which is COT7. Uh, the, Outstation then can send an act term or a TIN to terminate that control. Once again, the specification defines which of these COTs can be used for different ASDUs. Also note that the specification allows multiple command requests of the same type ID to be sent simultaneously before a response is received. This is in contrast to DNP3 in which multiple simultaneous requests are not supported. The control address specifies the particular ASDU that's being controlled. Note that the point being controlled and the monitored point that is reading back that the control happened will have different addresses. This is handled in the Triangle Microworks test harness by defining an offset between the control point and the monitored point. Now, what we use by default in the sample database is we have an offset from the control object from the monitored object by a fixed offset. That's convenient in our sample database that we use, but it's not required by the specification. The only requirement in the specification is the two addresses have to be unique. So for example, you could have control point seven and monitor point 102. They don't have to be an even offset. They just have to be different. If you're using the Triangle Microworks library and the default database, there is a fixed offset uh, and the points will be offset by that much. The, the control point and the monitor point will be offset by that fixed offset. 
Again, you don't have to do that in a real database. You can choose whatever makes sense. So the final application function we'll talk about is what's called a command transmission. This is basically when the master wants to control an output on the outstation. So this could be, for example, a single point output or a double point or even an analog set point. IEC 60870 supports what they call select and execute, which is similar to the select before operate in DNP3. Basically, it's the same thing. The master sends a select first, the outstation confirms that the control point has been selected, then the master sends the execute, and the outstation confirms that. Then the status of the output can be sent. Sending back the status of the output uh, can be done unrequested back to the master. It uses a different cause of transmission than a spontaneous, uh, but you know, for all intents and purposes, it looks very much like a spontaneous message. It is an event based response, in other words. Um, it's just an event that says that the point you just sent me a control for has actually changed like you asked for it to. If we look at the qualifier of command, you see short pulse, long pulse, and persistent. The persistent is similar to the latched in DNP3. So if I turn it on, it goes on and it stays on. Short pulse and long pulse will be a pulse output. If you tell me to pulse it, I turn it on for a preset period of time, then turn it off. In DNP3, that pulse time can be sent as part of the message. In IEC 60870-5, however, the pulse lengths are predetermined and are configured as a short pulse and a long pulse. And then the master just sends which one it wants. Does it want a short pulse or a long pulse? Um, so again, with DNP3, you could say, oh, send me a pulse of 1,000 milliseconds. Uh, in IEC 60870-5, you could only do that if 1,000 milliseconds was configured for either the short pulse or the long pulse time. So let's say, for example, it was configured as the long pulse time, then the master can send the request with the long pulse and the output would be pulsed for that 1,000 milliseconds. Okay, so let's go back to this example of a command ASDU. This is the single command, which is type 45. The cause of transmission, when it first sends the request, would be an activation, and then it would get an activation confirm back from the outstation. Then in this SCO, you would have the bit for select or execute. In the full sequence, this would first be sent with the select, in the single man with a cause of transmission of activation. Then the act con comes back with the same information. The execute would be sent with the act and then the act con and then the act term after that control is complete. And then optionally, the event can be sent to show the output status. So that's pretty much everything we wanted to cover here for the application layer. Next up, we'll go into the link layer. Next section gets into some of the more serious details, which can be important, but they may not be important in your application because if you're using the Triangle Microworks source code library, it will handle most of that for you.